Good morning, folks. We want to welcome you to our Grand Rounds presentation this morning. We have two groups that uh, have worked very hard in the uh, previous couple of weeks. Uh, they've been mentored by the faculty and helping them as this process continues. These students are members of first year uh, medical school. They are just in the process of winding down in their cardiovascular section right now. What they're going to do is present two cases. The uh, first group is uh, presenting an 18-year-old woman with an exercise-induced syncope. This case has got um, an interesting underlying etiology to the syncopal episodes. What the students have done, they've worked collaboratively together in dividing this uh, 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 case into different sections. And the concept is all uh, generated by part of their curriculum driven by uh, the course of medical informatics. Lori Fitterling has taken that lead on this and has helped to guide them in terms of where resources can be found, what evidence is out there, and how that evidence can be substantiated through their literature search. So uh, those of you that are on the uh, internet, uh, we certainly welcome you. You're in for a, a, a treat. Uh, there is a link to this uh, uh, presentation and that's been provided for you as well so please submit any questions that you might have and uh, from there we'll get started all right go ahead thank you uh, dr. Johnson so good morning uh, thank you guys all for coming we are group 11 and we're presenting our case with uh, 18 year old woman with exercise induced syncope Here is a photo of our group. So I'm a student, Dr. Alex Malloy, and I'll be presenting the clinical presentation today. So our patient, she was an 18-year-old female who presented to the emergency department to us, and she had been backpacking a few days ago where she uh, passed out while she was hiking with her friends. She reports walking up a steep hill and then the next thing that she remembered was just waking up on the trail. She was able to continue the hike um, without any intervention. So our past medical history. She, there were a previous syncopal episode a few years ago, but the patient was not evaluated at that time. There was no surgical history that was given. The patient denies any over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs. She does report to taking a daily multivitamin. There are no known drug allergies at the time. She denies any recreational drug use as well as dieting. Alcohol and tobacco information was not given. And she's a high school senior who's looking forward to college. There is a significant family med medical history of her younger brother having similar syncopal episodes within the past few years. And additionally, they denied any neurological or cardiac problems in their family. The vitals were all normal for our patient. So the initial examination, our patient appeared to be relaxed. She didn't have any undue stress or anxiety. She was alert and oriented. She denied any antecedent chest pain as well as shortness of breath, palpitations, and dizziness and incontinence. Those were all of the pertinent negatives that we found. So we systematically auscultated for S1 and S2 sounds, as well as any respiratory variations and accessory sounds during systole and diastole. We didn't find any rubs or murmurs or gallops. There was no jugular venous distension, and there was also no peripheral edema. So we then went to the lungs, and we found that they were clear to auscultation bilaterally. The neurological exam was all normal. And the GI, we found it to be soft and non-tender and without any masses. The laboratory test that we ordered included a CBC, a chemistry panel, a tox panel, and a pregnancy test. Those were all negative. And the chest, the chest radiograph was clear as well. And her, we then ordered an ECG. 
So right now our differential diagnosis all includes patine mal seizures, acute myocardial infarction, hypokalemia, and long QT syndrome. The reason that we chose these as our differential diagnosis is that we, they, these can all present with a loss of consciousness. Patine mal seizures don't generally, uh, they're not characteristically presenting with syncope, but they, any type of seizures and they can um, potentially lead to a loss of consciousness. So patine mal seizures, these are often called absent seizures. They are frequently occurring in children and the child will present with a blank stare as if they're just staring off into space. There's typically no loss of consciousness and they can be very frequent throughout the day and they're usually of short duration. On an EEG, we would expect to see spike and slow wave discharges similar to what you would see during sleep. And on CT, we wouldn't expect to see any focal lesions. So our patient, she's not within this age range. She did have a loss of consciousness. Those were the key things that we found that helped us rule out patine mal seizures as being one of our diagnoses. Next, we have acute myocardial infarction. So around half of myocardial infarctions can be triggered by strenuous activity. They may present with syncope, and approximately 20% of them are in diabetic elderly females, and these are silent, where they occur without chest pain. This is, what you, this is a timeline showing us what we would expect to see across the um, timeline after you've had a myocardial infarction. So our patient, we would expect to see here that she would have ST elevation and T wave inversion. Here's our patient's ECG. We did not see any sort of ST segment deviation at the J point, and we also don't see any abnormal Q waves where they're not supposed to be, um, or any T wave inversion, as you would expect to see following an ischemic, during an ischemic event. We then were able to rule out acute myocardial infarction. Next is hypokalemia. So hypokalemia can present as just a generalized weakness and cramping. They can also have palpitation, syncope, seizures, and cardiac arrest. Diagnostically, the metabolic panel would show that the serum potassium levels would be less than 3.5 milliequivalents, and there would be very similar ECG findings. What is really important here is that you get these very prominent U waves. You can also get T and U wave fusion, and this is the most important criterion for diagnosing hypokalemia. Our patient's ECG is up top, and hers is very similar, although she doesn't have the prominent U waves, and she also doesn't have the T and U wave fusion. So we were able to rule out hypokalemia as one of our differentials. Additionally, that the only other um, qualifying manifestation that she had was syncope. So our patient's ECG. We have here that our patient's heart rate was 65. And the thing with, the thing with ECGs is that the heart rate can influence the um, things like the QT interval. So what we needed, what we did is there are different formulas you can use to correct for the QT interval. And because the QT interval, it's inversely related to heart rate. So if you, we were able to calculate an adjusted QT interval to be 0.61 seconds. And any QT interval for a female patient with this heart rate that's beyond 0.44 seconds is considered abnormal and also prolonged. So since our QTC is 0.61 and that's beyond the 0.44 seconds that would be considered abnormal, we determined that this patient had an abnormal and prolonged QT interval. So that's diagnostic.
for long QT syndrome is a prolonged QT interval, which we found on her ECG. And then clinically, this would manifest as palpitation, syncope, seizures, and most importantly, cardiac arrest. This is um, one of the ways that there can be sudden cardiac death in, in young, otherwise healthy patients. And now I will hand it off to student Dr. Landon Mubinchi for our final diagnosis. Thank you, student Dr. Malloy. My name is student Dr. Landon McGlinchey, and I will lead us through the etiology, pathophysiology, treatment, osteopathic manipulative medicine, research and ethical legal considerations, patient education, and then a conclusion. Long QT syndrome is either a congenital or an acquired syndrome. The acquired form can arise from medications such as cyclic antidepressants, antiarrhythmic agents, electrolyte imbalance, such as hypokalemia, and other causes such as illicit drug use or myocardial ischemia. As for the congenital or inherited side, there have been 12 mutations identified. We will look at the top three most common. Mutations in type 1 and type 2 LQT specifically affect potassium channels. Type 1 and 2 account for 90% of all inherited LQT cases. Strenuous exercise and emotional stress are arrhythmic triggers for type 1 and 2, respectively. Type 3 involves mutations affecting sodium channels. Type 3 represents 7% of all total inherited cases and is characterized by malignant arrhythmias at rest. Here is more detail concerning ion channel abnormalities. First, all LQTS genes encode proteins affecting cardiac ion current. LQTS type 1 and 2 are the most common affecting potassium ion channels. For example, we will explore LQT type 2. This illustrated protein in the cardiac myocyte membrane is a potassium channel that conducts the delayed rectifying potassium current. We are viewing the protein product of gene KCHN2, the alpha subunit HERG. Most commonly, LQTS affects phase 3 of the ventricular action potential. This is seen in both LQT type 1 and 2. In a normal phase 3, delayed rectifying potassium channels open, creating an outward potassium current. And calcium channels, which were open in phase 2, close, generating a decrease in inward calcium current. The large outward potassium current repolarizes the membrane potential towards the resting level. The figure demonstrates this. Here in phase three, we see a decrease in inward calcium current and a large increase in outward potassium current, illustrated in red and then yellow. Congenital LQTS is an inherited cardiac arrhythmia that can cause sudden death. Long QT syndrome causes 4,000 deaths per year. Refractory period is when the electrolyte gates have not reset sufficiently to allow a second action potential to be generated, and this is important to help prevent arrhythmias. A prolonged QT interval increases the risk of cardiomyocytes depolarizing during refractory and generate a premature action potential before complete repolarization of the ventricles. The pictures on the right illustrate how after repetitive premature depolarization during phase three, 
of LQTS can cause brief episodes of torsade de pointe, characterized by brief ventricular rates of above 200 beats per minute, which can lead to sudden death. The dark red line is what we, what we would see normally, but the dotted line illustrates generation of second depolarization during phase three, and this leads to torsade de point. These episodes of torsade de point are more likely to occur with increased catecholamine levels, what is termed adrenergic dependent. Based on our final diagnosis, there are a few therapeutic options. First option is medication. Most often prescribed medications for long QT syndrome are propranolol and natalol. These drugs are beta blockers. Beta blockers decrease heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure by inhibiting the effects of adrenaline. Patients with congenital long QT require lifelong beta blocker usage to reduce the risk of arrhythmias. Patients with long QT should avoid any drugs that are known to prolong QT interval or reduce serum potassium or magnesium levels. Through surgery, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator can be utilized. These have been shown to be highly effective in preventing sudden cardiac death. Patients not improving with pharmaceuticals will most likely discuss these surgery, this surgery as treatment options. Lifestyle changes may also be therapeutic. Caution needs to be considered in exercise. Similar to our patient, strenuous exercise can increase risk for, an, for a cardiac event like syncope. Patients with long, Q, long QT syndrome type 1 are especially sensitive to exercise. Competitive sports, swimming, and diving are discouraged. Now we will transition to looking at osteopathic manipulative medicine for treatment options. As for OMM, all treatments that increase sympathetic tone are contraindicated. In adrenergic dependent LQTS, sympathetic activity should be avoided. Performing an osteopathic structural exam will locate somatic dysfunction that was brought on by our patient's fall. Treating this somatic dysfunction will reduce pain and therefore decrease sympathetic response. And now for emerging research. Current research seeks to understand the ECG signals associated with risk. In particular, the presence of a J point is a current topic. J point was originally considered to be benign. It occurs during depolarization of the ventricles. However, it is now associated with increased risk of idiopathic ventricular fibrillation and cardiac death. This research also asserts that early repolarization has been linked with abnormal QT intervals as well. The conclusion to this study states, early repolarization in ECG may be useful in making an early diagnosis of patients susceptible to LQTS. Next, the ethical and legal considerations, and then patient education. Our patient is an 18-year-old in high school. She still lives at home with her family. These are important to note to understand that our patient is legally autonomous, however, not yet developmentally autonomous. This means that by law, our patient is an adult. We would like to involve her family with the news of her diagnosis. However, all healthcare professionals must ask permission to communicate with her family. Suggesting to the patient a family conference setting to discuss treatment options, lifestyle changes, and also the risk associated with her brother may be beneficial. A dilemma we face is finding a balance of recommended changes. With strenuous exercise, we increase the risk of arrhythmias and life-threatening cardiac events. As indicated, four to five percent of cardiac events lead to sudden death. If we were to counsel our patient to avoid exercise, the consequences include increased sedentary lifestyle 
which may lead to hypertension, coronary heart disease, or certain types of cancers that are leading causes of death. Another cons consequence that we infer is the likelihood of our patient losing a hobby. We know she came from a hike for this latest syncopal episode. If we were to discourage hiking, would that dramatically affect her well-being, losing a hobby? We pose the question, is it more dangerous for the patient to exercise or avoid exercise? Patient education. At present, screening, genetic screening is useful but not reliable. We will need to explain this to our patient. There is also a need to educate our patient on the risk associated with biological relatives. Teaching our patient the dangers of taking certain medications is also key. Some antiarrhythmic medications, cyclic antidepressants, antihistamines, and phenothiazines may be problematic. Patients should avoid sudden noises, strenuous exercise, and factors that trigger cardiac events. Patients should be taught that those close to her, including her family in this case, need to be taught CPR. Our case background does not guide us on how our patient feels. As we discuss and counsel our patient, we may notice a need for mental health support. We may refer our, our patient for counseling and coping strategies. In conclusion, I'd like to highlight a few points concerning our case. Patients admitted after a cardiac event should be monitored closely. Delaying diagnosis may invoke irreversible consequences. Diagnostic tests including ECG, serum, potassium and magnesium, thyroid function, and pharmacologic provocation with epinephrine are important while evaluating the heart. An 18-year-old in high school is our patient and may be suspicious for recreational drug use. A drug screen may be indicated. And family members should also be tested following a congenital diagnosis. Lastly, the ethical considerations for a patient who is legally but not developmentally autonomous. We'd like to thank those that have helped our presentation. And now we will transition to answering questions. Okay, who would like to start with the questions? I know you got some. All right, introduce yourself. Hello, my name is student Dr. Kevin Kai, and my question is, are there any antibiotics that can cause LQT syndrome? Uh, there are uh, a couple that uh, affect the LQT syndrome, and the, the chief of greater effect, uh, the greatest effects are from the antibiotics erythromycin followed by azithromycin and clarithromycin, uh, with uh, the biggest one being like erythromycin that can double the risk of cardiac arrest. And uh, it, erythromycin is an antibiotic useful for the treatment of a number of bacterial infections, including uh, respiratory tract infections, skin infections, chlamydia infections, and syphilis. But of course, you have that running risk of extending that QT. Hi, my name is student Dr. Julie Liang. So I'll be answering the question, what is torsada points and how does it relate to LQTS? So in LQTS, the QT prolongation could lead to torsada points. It's characterized by brief episodes of rapid ventricular arrhythmia, where there's a rate of 200 to 350 beats per minute. A long QT interval basically creates a vulnerable window where cardiomyocytes myocytes can depolarize from refractory before ventricular repolarization is complete. So if the early depolarization reaches threshold, it may generate an action potential in the ventricles and cause a premature ventricular contraction. So by this mechanism, if there's rep repetitive premature depolarizations in the ventricles, it could lead to multiple PVCs and therefore torsada points. So episodes of torsades in patients with congenital LQTS may be triggered by stress, fear, or strenuous exercise. Patients with torsades usually present with recurrent episodes of palpitation, dizziness, and syncope. Sudden cardiac death can occur with the first episode. Similar to LQTS, treatment options include implantable cardiac defibrillator and beta blockers. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Long, student Dr. Andrew Long, and I got the question, was there a cardiac enzymes test run um, for the acute myocardial infarction differential diagnosis? 
So a brief background on the cardiac enzymes test. Um, so you were using um, a sample of the patient's blood to test for um, troponin I, troponin T, and creatine kinase MB. And while these in a healthy um, adult are low in um, low levels in the blood, there will be an increase um, after myocardial infarction. And so this will um, indicate uh, cardiac myocyte death. And so this is a useful, um, it's a useful test to also document the timeline of when the myocardial infarction may have occurred. But um, as student Dr. Malloy stated, um, there were no ECG wave morphologies indicating a, a past MI, and there, but there were very characteristic morphologies for long QT syndrome, so no, there was no um, cardiac enzymes test run for this patient. Hi, I'm student Dr. Brooke McDonald, and my question was, why, are it, why is magnesium sulfate and potassium used as diet supplements in the treatment? And magnesium and potassium are often used more as a short-term prevention for TERSADs, but magnesium especially is short-term because it does not shorten the QTC interval significantly. Potassium is more important in that, especially in patients that have the genetic defect regarding the LQ. T2 and gene, that it can lead to a significant decrease in the QTC interval by taking potassium and having that elevated level of serum potassium. However, they do have to be monitored a little bit more closely to make sure they do not develop hyperkalemia. Hello, uh, my name is student Dr. Shelby Kirkendall, and the question I'm going to be answering today is. Um, is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator a viable treatment option in pediatric patients as well as in adults? Um, a little background, um, ICDs are indicated in, indicated in patients um, that have survived a cardiac arrest and who are expected to survive at least one year with good functional status. Um, typically, they tra try beta blockers first, and if they have um, residual episodes, of arrhythmias than an ICD is indicated. So um, they are indicated in pediatric use. However, there are some special considerations they have to take into account. Um, the ratio of the size of the child to the size of the device. Um, you have to take into account the increased physical activity in children compared to adults. And also the child may outlive the device, which would mean the device would have to be taken out and replaced. Good morning. I'm student Dr. Karen Lawrence. There were two questions submitted asking about pregnancy in this patient. Um, so Medscape does say that pregnancy is not associated with an increased risk of cardiac events. However, the postpartum period has a substantially increased risk of cardiac events. It is also worth noting that beta blockers are in pregnancy class C, um, so they should only be used if the benefit outweighs the risk. And beta blocker used during pregnancy has been associated with intrauterine growth restriction, preterm birth, and perinatal mortality. And then, of course, there's always the risk that the child will inherit long QT from the mother. Um, so it's just important that the patient has all of this informa information so she can make an educated decision about her reproductive health. I'm student Dr. Tim Kenny, and my question is, why do kids grow out of petite mal epilepsy? And the short answer for that is we don't know. But um, they are typically treated with valproic acid or ethosuximide. And this is effective in about 75% of the cases. So you never really see them once it's been diagnosed, which is rather difficult to do because it can be often mistaken for daydreaming. But um, once they get to about age 18 or 20, uh, they are start to be weaned off either of these medications. And they usually have no further uh, episodes. Hi, my name is student Dr. Daniel Kim, and my question is why is genetic testing not reliable for diagnosing LQTS? So there's several factors to consider. The main ones are genetic polymorphism. So because of the different DNA sequences that we have of ion channels, uh, just because you have a mutation in a certain sequence does not mean your ion channel will not function in the same way. The second is Negative genetic testing does not mean you'll have the disease as only about 70 to 75% of the patients have their mutated gene identified so far. And also 
even if we had uh, proper genetic testing, which has been useful, uh, the different mutations would lead to the same um, clinical treatment, ultimately. And so the most reliable way is to look at patient symptoms, family medical history, and physical examination, and also genetic testing so that we can further our research in that area. Those questions uh, were, were answered quite well. I want to uh, introduce a couple of concepts here, particularly to your colleagues out here. <clears throat> when you are reviewing an electrocardiogram, a lot of times uh, the thing that will catch your eye is the length of the systole and the QT and the uh, duration of that QT interval. Oftentimes, you don't remember how to calculate it. So the simplest way to remember that is the QT interval should be 50% less than the R to R interval. So that would give you the ballpark uh, likelihood that you are or you're not dealing with a, a long QT interval syndrome. So just remember your QT interval should be 50% less than your R to R interval. That's the way to remember that. The next thing is that when you do see that issue, keep in mind the possibility of hypocalcemia contributing to this uh, elongation of the QT interval. Um, the other concepts of torsades were addressed, I thought, quite appropriately. Just remember the party streamer uh, that Dubin's textbook has, and that's literally what uh, the torsades uh, complex tachycardia looks like. It's twisting of the complexes in multiple directions, like a tornado would go through. And torsades is difficult to treat and get them out. You know, this lady was, had a sudden onset of a syncopal episode while hiking. So let's assume that's a strenuous form of exercise. What do you think the most likely arrhythmia was that she encountered? I didn't hear that brought up, wasn't discussed other than torsades. Were there any others that she could have encountered? VTAC, absolutely. VTAC can be a harbinger for torsades. Um, absolutely. VTAC would be in your differential. Um, the fact that she regains spontaneous recovery without any sequelae, she is lucky, isn't she? What's the likelihood that her brother has similar problem? It's definitely got to be checked, doesn't he? Uh, there's a good possibility for that. And then the other thing is, look at the list of drugs that can potentially prolong <clears throat> that QT interval. These are commonly prescribed medications that uh, will all prescribe uh, the antibiotics, the erythromycin, the z pack the clarithromycin. How many patients come to you from nursing homes uh, on antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, antihistamines can do it as well. So we've got to be cognizant of those problems, uh, those facts, when you're taking and prescribing medications for your patients. Um, overall, I thought your presentations were very good, gentlemen. I thought your content was well explained, and I thought the answers to your questions uh, were spot on. So class, let's give them a hand of applause, and the next group, come on up.
Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, faculty, and staff, fellow colleagues, thank you for joining us. Today we will be presenting the case of a 37-year-old woman with palpitations and nerve syncope. We are group 12 of Grand Rounds at Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences, and this is our team. My name is student Dr. Samir Mian, and I will be presenting the patient presentation as well as discuss discussing the differential diagnoses. So let's begin. Our patient is a 37-year-old female who is presenting to the emergency department with the chief complaint of a panic attack. She reports having chest pounding palpitations, is feeling a racing heart, is having difficulty breathing, and also feeling lightheaded. She is also beginning to, feeling, beginning to feel the onset of chest heaviness. These symptoms began when she was playing water polo, although she, she states that she's been having these episodes for several years. Typically, they're intermittent, and they go away on their own within 10 to 15 minutes. Her current episode, however, did not seem to resolve. She immediately began to feel fatigued and felt as if she may pass out, for which reason she was brought to the emergency department. The patient has had a full and complete cardiac workup in the past, however, this was essentially normal. She has received the diagnosis of anxiety disorder with panic attacks from her primary care provider, for which she is taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Despite this treatment, however, she continues to have several episodes of these panic attacks per year. There is no other past medical history known. Her surgical, past surgical history, family history, and social history are also unknown. Uh, she's taking SSRIs, as previously uh, described, and her allergies are unknown at this time. On vital signs, our patient is well oxygenated. However, she seems to be significantly hypotensive with an extremely fast heart rate. Her respiration rate is normal, and her temperature is unknown at this time. On physical exam, our patient seems to be in good athletic condition. However, she is pale and diaphoretic. She's also lethargic and in mild respiratory distress. Her cardiovascular exam reveals no noticeable S1 or S2 sounds. However, does reveal an irregular tachycardic rhythm. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally, and her extremities are free of edema, but they are cool and have faint distal pulses. These are the results of her initial ECG. You'll notice that we have an irregular wide complex tachycardia here with 224 beats per minute. And if you look at lead one and AVF, we have a right axis deviation. Now, before we go into a discussion of our differential diagnosis, it's important to consider the patient's immediate condition. We have irregular tachycardia, significant hypotension, and an altered mental state. This tells us that our patient is currently hemodynamically unstable and at a high risk of sudden cardiac death. The American Heart Association's ACLS tachycardia algorithm is initiated, which tells us that a synchronized cardioversion procedure needs to be performed so that the patient can be brought to a stable nature. Student Dr. Braden Nelson's presentation will go further into what a synchronized cardioversion is. After synchronized cardiovision, our patient reverted to normal sinus rhythm. And here you'll see we have a normal axis at 58 beats per minute. So let's, let's discuss our differential diagnosis. We'll be discussing ventricular tachycardia, both monomorphic and polymorphic. We'll be looking at atrial fibrillation with aberrancy, as well as, well as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome with atrial fibrillation. Let's begin with ventricular tachycardia. We're looking at this because it's the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in the United States. Any fast rhythm, faster than 120 beats per minute, with three or more PVCs in a row, is considered ventricular tachycardia. More importantly, episodes of ventricular tachycardia can be brief and self-terminating, and the patient may present as asymptomatic. This is the typical clinical presentation of patients with ventricular tachycardia and you'll see that our patient has many of the features involved. Here we are looking at the ECG of a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. You'll notice that each QRS morphology is uniform. 
the, the QRS morphology is identical from beat to beat. And this is because the stimulus for the ventricular tachycardia is originating from a single ventricular automaticity focus. When we compare that to one of the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, you'll now notice that the QRS morphology is vary, is, is, varies from beat to beat. And this is because they are originating from multiple foci. In addition, you can also see here, within the same lead, and over here we're looking at AVL, you'll see a change in direction of that QRS morphology. This is also because they are occurring from different foci. Important to note that patients who have polymorphic ventricular tachycardia can spontaneously revert to sinus rhythm. Now we'll look at atrial fibrillation with aberrancy. It's important to note here there are two separate conditions concurrently occurring concurrently uh, over here. We have atrial fibrillation and an aberrant conduction pathway. Patients have non-specific symptomatology, many of which are, uh, are presented with our, in, our, in our patient's clinical presentation. In 80% of cases, the aberrant conductive pathway in atrial fibrillation occurs through a right bundle branch block morphology. We can see this on an ECG and identify it by an R, S, R prime variant in lead V1. So over here you'll see R, S, R prime. Next, we'll be looking at Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome with atrial fibrillation. This is a congenital condition that involves the early stimulation of ventricles through an accessory pathway. The common clinical presentation you'll see, our patient per fits perfectly. In a nor normal cardiac exam, the patient may be asymptomatic, and so we may get uh, normal results on a cardiac examination. And the onset of WPW can be from childhood to middle age. These are the hallmarks of identifying WPW when looking at the ECG of a patient. You will see uh, an irregular tachycardia that varies from beat to beat. You'll also notice a short PR interval and this slow upward slurring we call the delta wave. Now, which of these does our patient have? Let's now look further and evaluate the sinus rhythm ECG to see what we can learn from that. This is our patient's sinus rhythm ECG, and I've isolated a few here, and you'll see that we have a short PR interval, shorter than 0.12 seconds. I've noted that here. But you can see this over here, over here, and over here. We also see that slow upward slur called the delta wave, the pre-excitation, and as well as the wide QRS morphology present here, but we also saw that in the initial ECG. These characteristics are not present on the ECG of a patient with ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation with aberrancy. In fact, our patient's clinical presentation fits the perfect picture of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome with atrial fibrillation. For this reason, we believe this is the most likely condition that our patient is experiencing. And now student Dr. Braden Nelson is going to continue the, with the basic science, treatment, ethics, and emerging research. Thank you, student doctor. Thank you, student Dr. Mian. Um, I'm student Dr. Braden Nelson, and I'll be walking us through the basic science, treatment, ethics, and emerging research for our Wolf Parkinson White patient. Well, Parkinson-White syndrome is a condition that affects 0.1 to 0.3 percent of the population. Of those affected, 15 to 30 percent also experience atrial fibrillation. Interesting, interestingly, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is prevalent in people of Chinese descent, where it accounts for up to 70 percent of supraventricular tachycardia cases. The majority of Wolf-Parkinson-White cases have an unknown cause. However, a small portion of Wolf-Parkinson-White cases carry a genetic component. The PRKAG2 gene uh, codes for a protein in the AMP activated protein kinase enzyme. Any one of seven different mutations can cause an autosomal dominant mutation or autosomal dominant yeah, mutation that results in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. In normal heart physiology, we see the depolarizing wave starting at the SA node and extending outward through the atria, causing atrial contraction. Simultaneously, the depolarizing wave travels to the AV node, 
where it experiences a short delay before traveling through the bundle of Hiss, down the left and right bundle branches, and into the Purkinje system, where it contacts the ventricular myocytes and causes ventricular contraction. Uh, in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, we see the presence of accessory pathways that bypass the AV node to cause, uh, to depolarize the ventricles early. The resultant tachycardia that our patient experienced is a fusion of both the accessory pathway and no, uh, normal pathway uh, depolarization. In uh, a normal ECG, we see the PR interval is here, um, should last between 120 and 200 milliseconds. In our patient, we, we see a shortened PR interval, less than 120 milliseconds, and this is due to the fact that our de the depolarizing wave coming through the accessory pathway skips the AV node where it normally experiences a delay. We also see the QRS complex here, which in a normal patient should last between 70 and 100, oh, sorry, 100 milliseconds. Uh, in our patient, we see a wide complex tachycardia, meaning a QRS complex of greater than 100 milliseconds. This is due to the fact that when the depolarizing wave passes into the ventricles through the accessory pathway, it doesn't uh, conduct from cell to cell as quickly as if it was passing through the normal conductive pathways. Um, on the left, we see a normal uh, ECG, and on the right, we see an ECG printout from our patient. We're going to zoom in on the portion circled in red to look at a delta wave. A delta wave uh, is a slurred uptake in the QRS complex seen here, but not seen here in a tight, nice QRS complex. The delta wave, again, is due to the slow conduction through the ventricular tissue caused by the accessory pathway. Uh, in addition to Wolf-Parkinson-White, our patient is experiencing atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is irregularly irregular, meaning that in our ECG, you would see an uh, irregular number of atrial depolarizations to ventricular depolarizations, uh, varying from uh, beat to beat. Our heart rate, or the, patient of our, the heart rate of our patient is 170 to 300 beats per minute, which is consistent with a cycle of atrial fibrillation with a one-to-one -one activation of ventricles through this accessory pathway. Our patient was treated with synchronized cardioversion followed by procainamide. Our patient then underwent a, underwent a radiofrequency ablation, which was successful. Uh, at a three-month follow-up visit, our patient had no need for antiarrhythmic medication, and in fact, because of the lack of panic attack symptoms, we elected to wean our patient off selective serotonin re reuptake inhibitors. While selecting treatment options for Wolf-Parkinson-White, uh, we first obviously followed the American Heart Association's ACLS algorithm which led us to synchronize cardioversion, which will be discussed later. We then considered pharmacological options and then radiofrequency catheter ablation as a definitive and curative treatment. For our pharmacological options, uh, we chose between ibutilide and procainamide. Ibutilide is an antiarrhythmic drug that affects potassium efflux. However, we chose procainamide. Procainamide is the drug of choice when your patient is young and is at risk for a drug-induced elongated QT interval. An elongated QT interval uh, is a risk for our patient because she's already experiencing a, a wide complex tachycardia, and a further elongated QT interval could send our patient into ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. Contraindicated in our case is an AV nodal blocker such as di digoxin or other cardiac glycosides. Uh, digoxin works by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase pump and uh, is contraindicated because since we already have the presence of an accessory pathway, we wouldn't want to block the normal pathway because this might shunt extra electro -elect electrical activity through the accessory pathway and exacerbate our patient's condition. Synchronized cardioversion is a treatment in which we place electrical leads on the patient's chest and deliver a 120 to 200 joule shock. The, synchronized pro, uh, the goal of synchronized cardioversion is to convert a fibrillation to a normal sinus rhythm. 
The synchronized portion of synchronized cardioversion refers to the fact that the, the jolt, the electrical shock is delivered at the height of the R wave on the, on the ECG. And this is important because if we were to deliver the shock during the T wave, during the repolarization of the ventricles, this corresponds to this uh, supranormal uh, refractory period during which the ventricular myocytes are extra vulnerable to re-excitation. This might cause our patient to go into ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. <coughs> Excuse me. For radiofrequency catheter ablation, uh, we have a video we'd like to show from the Cleveland Clinic. But before showing the video, it's important to note that there are multiple pathways through which, multiple accessory pathways um, that can affect uh, our patient in, in Wolf Parkinson White. In the video, they'll talk about uh, a pathway through the pulmonary veins. Uh, and this was not the pathway used in our patient, but it's instructive to see what radiofrequency catheter ablation is and how it can be used in our patient. So uh, ablation as a means of uh, controlling and settling down this atrial fibrillation can vastly improve those patients' uh, lives. We know the initial trigger, the initial spark or the initial firing for atrial fibrillation tends to come from the pulmonary veins. And these are the four veins that are draining blood that has just gone through the lung and picked up oxygen back to the left side of the heart so it can then be pumped everywhere it needs to go. There's little muscular sleeves that line those veins and those muscle cells for whatever reason in select individuals can act in a very irritable fashion where they fire very, very rapidly. And that tends to serve as the initial spark that uh, sets people off into atrial fibrillation, shorting out the entire chamber. Medicines, when we use them as an approach to, to the management of atrial fibrillation, try to calm down that irritability. When the medicines are ineffective and we're going to take the patient to the next uh, level of our therapeutic approach and go for an ablation procedure, what we're doing is burning or ablating the tissue around those veins to ultimately turn that tissue over into scar. Scar doesn't conduct electricity, therefore if there's electrical firing within the vein, that electrical firing can't exit the vein and short out the entire chamber. So essentially, a catheter ablation is similar to a heart catheterization, which most patients are probably familiar with. Typically, at the clinic here, we use three or four catheters uh, that have different functions. What we do is we put those catheters through the groin all the way in the heart. One catheter is, for example, an intracardiac ultrasound so that we can see what's going on inside the heart. Another catheter is the ablation catheter. And then we have a catheter, which is the mapping catheter, so that we can uh, look at the electrical activity inside the left atrium. As we cross to the left side of the heart, the left atrium, this is where actually most of the action of atrial fibrillation uh, happens. And we, we use the mapping catheter to see where the electrical activity is and how much electrical activity is around the pulmonary veins. And we use the ablation catheter to cauterize and eliminate this electrical activity and to confirm that we have isolation of the pulmonary veins uh, so that the impulses that come from the pulmonary veins don't make it to the left atrium and therefore maximizing the chances of keeping the patient in normal rhythm. We don't use... Um, as, osteo as osteopathic medical, is it on? Yeah. As osteopathic medical students, uh, we looked into using osteopathic manipulation as a treatment for Wolf Parkinson White. However, unfortunately, there was a lack of direct research about the use of OMM for Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and we elected to forego the use of OMM on our patient. For emerging research, <coughs> uh, there is. An interesting study done by Bunch, May, and uh, Bear, in which they followed over 2,000 patients with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Um, these patients, some chose to undergo a radiofrequency catheter ablation, and others chose not to. It was found that in the patients who did undergo the radiofrequency ab uh, ablation procedure, they had better long term outcomes in terms of mortality over a 20 year post operative period. However, it was also found that radiofrequency catheter ablation did not decrease the long-term risk for atrial fibrillation. Um, radiofrequency catheter ablation has a 95% success rate. It's important to note that the, for the 5% of patients for whom the a radiofrequency catheter ablation is not successful, it may be due to the presence of other accessory pathways which were not ablated during the original procedure. In these patients, we can go back in with a unipolar or bipolar electrogram to better localize the accessory pathways being used uh, by the heart to cause issues, and we can then ablate those tissues, uh, hopefully, to cure the problem. <laughs>
For ethical consideration, since there is a small genetic component, we would recommend genetic counseling to any patient who tested po positive for the PRKAG2 gene. And there are also studies supporting radiofrequency ablation um, as a prophylactic procedure for those who are asymptomatic. This would need to be a cost-benefit decision um, and discussion between the physician and the patient uh, during which the physician and patient together came to a decision about what was best for the patient. For patient education, the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndromes uh, Organization and the National Organization for Rare Disorders both have excellent websites with pages on Wolf Parkinson White for patient education. Here's our bibliography. And we'd like to acknowledge the following individuals for their contribution to our presentation. And at this point, we'll open it up to questions. Hi, good morning. Is it on? OK, good morning. My name is, or I am student Dr. Jacob Novak. A little bit louder, closer, OK. Um, one of the questions that we got was, what is the definition of aberrancy? And so an aberrant conduction is when the supraventricular impulse travels to the ventricle in a way that is different from what's considered normal. Um, the refractoriness in any bundle branch uh, does not allow the supraventricular impulse to propagate in that branch, and this results in a bundle branch block, which causes the uh, wide QRS complex that is seen with, um, with aberration. Um, since the refractory period of the right bundle branch is longer than the left, aberration um, typically occurs uh, in 80% of cases as a right bundle branch block. Um, but in patients with abnormal halt, hearts, uh, aberration can occur as a left bundle branch block as well. Um, and it is also important to note that in any type of uh, superventricular rhythm, um, aberrancy can appear. Hi, I'm student Dr. Bunsi Patel. Um, the next question we got was, what is the difference between synchronized and unsynchronized cardioversion? So unsynchronized cardioversion um, is a high energy shock that can fall anywhere in the QRS complex. So the only time that it is indicated is if the patient is pulseless or if the defibrillator won't synchronize in an unstable patient. Um, we used synchronized cardioversion in our patient, which is a low energy shock, um, and that synchronizes with the patient's ECG rhythm. This avoids the shock being administered during the ventricular repolarization, or the T wave, um, and that decreases the likelihood of a ventricular fibrillation occurring. I'm student Dr. Paige Owens-Kurtz, and I'm answering the question um, regarding what would put um, a patient with WPW at a greater risk of death. Um, and so we would term it sudden cardiac death versus um, sudden cardiac death, um, ab aborted sudden cardiac death, um, which is when there has been an intervention, um, named mostly defibrillate defibrillation. Um, and patients that are under um, certain qualifications demographically, particularly a younger age, um, even in, in children diagnosed um, male episodes of syncope, which our patient also had, um, atrial fibrillation, also our patient had, and then also inducible atrial, fi atrial fibrillation um, during an EP study, which is an electrical physiology study. And then also having um, multiple accessory pathways um, also increases the risk of sudden, sudden cardiac death um, in WPW. There, um, they do differentiate between asymptomatic and symptomatic cardiac death. Um, and in symptomatic cardiac death, the, the percentage of patients with WPW that eventually um, do um, have sudden cardiac death is about 0.38% in the population. So, and then in terms of activities to avoid, um, it really does depend on what brings about the arrhythmia. Um, because with WPW, you have the, um, the a pathway, and then you also have um, an accompanying um, tachycardia. And so it depends on what brings about that tachycardia. Um, in, in patients, including ours, uh, it was an activity or an exercise-induced tachycardia. And so in that instance, you would avoid um, sports. And so from a clinical perspective, um, as a doctor with a patient 
with WPW, you might need to, as a child, you might need to, need to write um, a note um, exempting them from PE or something along that side. I am student Dr. Mike Petrelli. I've got a question. Uh, what lab tests would you normally order for someone with these symptoms? And uh, a follow-up, would WPW present in any blood work, or is it purely an electrical pathology? And uh, for someone with these uh, presenting symptoms, uh, I mean, lightheadedness, near syncope, palpitations, uh, it could be a, a number of different things. So we order a number of different labs. But there's no, unfortunately, there's no absolute indication for WPW. Uh, the formal diagnosis for WPW is based on electrocardiogram uh, cardiogram results with clues uh, from the, the patient's history and physical examination. For the, uh, for the actual uh, lab uh, ordering, we, we would order a uh, complete blood count, uh, check to see if there might be an underlying infection, perhaps an anemia. Uh, we'd, we'd also order a comprehensive metabolic panel, uh, evaluate uh, blood chemical balance, serum, uh, glucose, electrolytes. Um, we could also order a cardiac enzyme, uh, identify perhaps there's an acute MI, uh, specifically looking for either a troponin T or I, or depending on the test, uh, creatine kinase MB proteins. Uh, we could also look for maybe thyroid function uh, by looking at the thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, lastly, we, we would also order some imaging like uh, echocardiography or MR, a, a MRI or CT. Hi, my name is student Dr. Stephen Morris, and we have a question that came in reading what other sorts of diagnostic tools can be used to test for WPW. Um, so three tests I'll talk about right now include echocardiography, stress testing, and electrophysiologic studies. Um, so an echo may be used to evaluate for uh, left ventricular function, septal uh, thickness, and wall motion abnormalities. Um, it can also be used to exclude um, cardiomyopathy and associated congenital heart defects. Um, stress testing may be used to reproduce the transient uh, paroxysmal SVT, which is triggered by exercise. Um, it can also be used to document the relationship of exercise to the onset of tachycardia and um, to evaluate the e um, efficacy of antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Uh, finally, um, electrophysiologic studies can be used to determine the mechanism of the tachycardia. Um, it can be used to assess the electrophysiologic properties of the accessory pathway um, and evaluate the normal um, AV nodal and hiss Purkinje conduct conduction system. Um, so this would include evaluating um, conduction capability and refractory periods. Um, and finally, the EPS may be used to um, determine the number and locations of these accessory pathways which are necessary for um, catheter ablation um, and, and it can also be used um, to figure out the response to different pharmacological agents. Hello, my name is student Dr. Yujin Na and the question I will be answering is are accessory pathways always from the atria to the ventricles? And atrioventricular accessory pathways are not the only mechanism of early ventricular activation. There is another pre-excitation syndrome known as lone ganang levine syndrome, which in that case, there is an atriohissian pathway, which goes from the atria to the bundle of hiss, and that's called the bundle of James, and that bypasses the AV node. And so for the LGL syndrome in that EKG, it's similar, Similar to the WPW, it demonstrates a shortened PR in interval due to the bypassing of the AV node, but unlike WPW, it shows a normal QRS co complex and no delta wave. Hi, my name is student Dr. Paige O'Connor, and uh, we got a couple questions regarding uh, the patient's anxiety. Um, one was, what was her SSRI dose, and is she compliant with these meds, and if she's not, could they have led to her symptoms? Um, we did not have the dosage or the name of the SSRI our patient was prescribed. Um, there is data that shows that sertraline, which is an SSRI, may cause panic attacks in previously asymptomatic patients. However, since she um, had experienced these symptoms before and after pres prescribed uh, SSRIs, it's unlikely that the symptoms were from that. And if she were exper experiencing a panic attack, um, so the patient presented with similar 
symptoms, which includes palpitations, tachycardia, diaphoresis, dyspnea, and chest pain or pressure. Um, however, her ECG would probably simply present with sinus tachycardia. And in that case, we always treat the cause. <laughs> Hi, I'm student Dr. Andy Perloff. Um, we got the question, after treatment of WPW, what precautions should the patient take to move forward with living a healthy life? And it's really important that WPW's uh, syndrome patients are fully educated about their disease and fully educate their family members about the disease as, as well, just because there is a genetic component to this disease so that they can also advise them to go get screened um, for pre-excitation. Also, they should be educated on different vagal maneuvers uh, to slow down the fast heart rate that she can perform um, if a reoccurrence does, if there is reoccurrence. And also, she should be teaching her family members how to do that as well. Um, and another thing that they do advise is that our patient should be carrying around a sample ECG in sinus rhythm and a medical identification bracelet just in case of cardiac arrest. The last comment from what the doctor just mentioned is really important is to keep a, <clears throat> excuse me, a copy of your tracing perhaps in your wallet or your purse <clears throat> um, because the biggest differential diagnosis is a when they get into these tachyarrhythmias is a wide complex tachycardia. So if you can tell the attending that, hey, I have underlying pre-excitation syndrome, that eases a lot of angst. Your differential, as you have gone over, uh, for wide complex tachycardia entertains the concept of aberrancy, the concept of AFib bypassing the AV node through accessory pathways kicks that heart rate up to 250, 300 times a minute. And it's really difficult to tease it out, to say what this is. It's kind of a blessing in disguise that she became uh, hemodynamically unstable because the blood pressure started to drop, her, respir uh, her level of consciousness started to fade some. So they did the appropriate thing by synchronized cardioversion. Once that was done, then bingo, you had your answer right there that she had the short PR interval with the delta wave. So it was handled right, just textbook. But the hardest part is teasing it out to say, what's my differential and how do I approach this wide complex tachycardia? If you're in an ICU setting and you develop a wide complex tachycardia, play the odds. It's VTAC. It's from the heart attack. If somebody's young and relatively healthy and has a similar problem, it's less likely that they're going to have a heart attack. They could, but it's less likely. So if there's any predisposition, it's extremely important to wear that bracelet, carry that ID, and you really um, expedite uh, self-care in that urgent situation. I thought your... Um, your questions were really good. Your explanations were equally uh, good. Uh, your content of your PowerPoints were, were very good. So this is not too shabby for first-year medical students at KCU. Give them a round of applause and thank you.